Well, I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. It was uh, it was good. Um, still recovering from how much I ate because I did it again last night. Jesus Christ. Hey. That's going to be later. Just kidding. <laughs> um, as Chris said, um, you know, God's up to something in this season. This It, it, it is the season of Advent. Um, you know, there's there's different seasons in the Christian church, and there's different things that, that, that we celebrate and things that we have and things some things that we don't, you know. But Advent is, is one of those things that, that we should talk a lot more about because there's so many things in church that, that, that bring us down that, you know, it seems like it's this mood of church that, that we've not done a good job until we're crying and bawling in church, right? You ever did like that? I did, I did that for so long that, that I thought I wasn't doing a good job as a pastor if, if half the congregation wasn't crying by the end of it, right? And so there's this thing called Advent, and this is what, the Advent's about something completely different. It's this joyful anticipation of God of Jesus Christ, of the coming of Jesus and the, the, the coming, the second coming of Jesus. And so there's this, there's this moment in church where we're allowed for just a moment, it seems like, to just celebrate, even celebrate our weakness, even celebrate our, our sin and celebrate everything about us because we have a Savior, He's coming and His name is Jesus. And that's the season that we're in now. It starts today. And it goes through uh, the night before Christmas, the night before Jesus comes. It goes through the 24th. So what is Advent? I just want to, you know, I, nobody likes to come and learn in church, do they? <laughs> we just want you to preach, man. Don't teach us anything. Chris does that on Wednesdays. <laughs> uh, but no, no, seriously, it, it, it's, it's a big deal. And there's something, I, you know, there's a few things that I wrote down, you know, about it that, that, that means a lot to me. And, and one of the things is this is expectant waiting. You know, it's something that, 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 that we don't do a lot of. It's like, you, you know... It's, I've said this about the holidays so many different times that that we have this thing in the world. This we some call them an enemy, some call them a friend, <laughs> but but there's this enemy in the world that takes the very best of things and the very best of emotions that we have in our heart and twists them just a little bit. And it's not necessarily that bad of a thing to twist, but it turns it into something completely different. We have this anticipation, and all of us have since we were children, or at least most of us have, of Christmas. Right, and I can I can do one thing, and I, I, this was such a great point. Whenever I, I did this when we first started our study on Wednesday nights about saying, "Ho ho ho!" Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Huh? Does anybody know when I say "ho ho ho" what what that means? Nobody. Merry Christmas. Did I not do it good enough? Ho 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 ho! Now what am I talking about? Christmas. Does anybody know his story? <laughs> Christmas clown. Christmas clown. <laughs> does, anybody, does anybody know his story? Or, I mean, just yeah. literally, what, 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 what's Santa Claus about? So it's an old man that got out before. Is he a man or a elf? No, he was a he's real a clown. person. Saint uh, well, the, well, the poem says that he's a jolly old elf. He ain't no elf. I thought. <laughs> oh, okay. He's got a list. He he's got a list. Do what else do we know about Santa? He checks it twice. <laughs> he checks it twice. He's bad. He's so beast. He'll know if you're naughty or nice. What, he sees you when you're sleeping? He knows when you're awake? He's kind of a spooky guy? Creepy. He owns some beer. He owns some beer. <laughs> but what, what's most important about Santa? He gets you stuff. Oh, presents. Oh, he brings you things. He brings you presents. He's got stuff that you don't get for the rest of the year, but it's Santa, so he brings you stuff you don't get. And most of the time... I don't deserve it. Has anybody ever literally got coal for Christmas? That's the that's the thing, right? You're going to get coal if you're not good, but every little kid's so bad all year long, and they're good for like 12 hours before Christmas gets here. And some of them don't even make it then, right? They're, they're bad before they go to bed. And it, they don't make it, but still they wake up on Christmas morning, and there's everything laid out there before them. And I hear, I'm, I'm, and I'm not, you know, I love Christmas, and I, I go overboard. I love this decoration. I love everything about it. When you go by my house and you say, I can't believe he preached that message with all them blow-ups and all them lights all over his house. And, and, I, and, and it, it, that, that, that is the stereotypical hypocrite right there. I'm not saying I don't love it because I do, but i got to make it about the right thing, right? So what I'm saying is there's this little twist because all of that stuff we say about Santa sounds really familiar. He knows when you've been good and bad. 
He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you wake. He sees everything that you do. Guess who else does that? God. But guess what? It's not fictional. And this is the other thing. You know, whenever, when you, if you're really bad, you don't get what the, the good things of God. And, and it says when, when, when we die one day, we, we might actually stand before him and be judged. Well, we got that Santa Claus thing. It's like, well, I can still be mad and get all my presents. Well, that's not God. You know, this is anticipation and advent of something. And we've turned it into this, can't wait, let's rush through it, let's get to Christmas Eve so I can get all my presents. And God's like, no, this is, there's this joy in waiting. There's joy in it. In waiting in anticipation of God, of Christ. There's a wasp. And he's on the mirror. That's one of the two. Don't get stung, Amy. So Advent, this season that we're in, is about the coming of Christ. And I think so many people, I have friends that can't, I, and it's not just one or two, I have several friends who can't stand Christmas. And it's not because they're like, it's the commercialism of Christmas, that, they're not that, they're not that sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't like Christmas, and I can't understand why, and I always tell you, why are you going to throw the church answer on me, John? I'm like, well, how could a Christian not love Christmas? How could a Christian not love this season? And, and I can see why, because it's so many times made about something that it's not Advent. It's just, it's just this idea that we're waiting on Christ. The nativity of Jesus, absolutely. Celebrating that, celebrating his coming, God with us. But also celebrating the idea that he's coming back and he's coming soon. And we're anticipating that. And instead of readying ourselves, you know, you ever heard of Lent? Everybody know what that season is? That's another Christian season of the, on the calendar. And Lent is that time before Easter, you know, the, and it kind of represents the 40 days of Jesus' temptation in the desert and, and like this idea that, 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 that we're supposed to just be you know, almost like this solemn idea of, of like, oh man, I'm so sinful and I'm, I'm tempted by everything, but I'm going to lay it all down at the foot of the cross and I'm going to do this for 40 days until, you know, the resurrection and my sin's been defeated and all this. And it kind of represents that time, but this time is not like that. Yes, there's this cleaning out, there's this getting ready for there's this cleansing of ourselves this joyful cleansing that we're like hey we're preparing for this guest that we really want to come to our house <laughs> right we really want to invite them in you ever had somebody you just can't wait for them to get there i can't wait to see them i can't wait for them to come see me i can't that's what this idea is this this kind of we like to make it kind of cozy you know we got some good smelling candles and all this kind of stuff we make we make our home real cozy we got some people coming over and we've got some new furniture or whatever it is We've, we've cleaned it up and we can't wait for them to get there because they're going to come in and share a meal or share a cup of coffee. They're going to come in, sit by the fire with us and enjoy the things that we enjoy with us. And that's this season of Advent. It's this joyful anticipation. It is this, 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 this joyful waiting. This thing where we're coming into this season where we're like, this is our best friend coming to see us. This is our king this is the one who sits with us through all of our hard times and all of our good times. This is the one who gives us every breath, who lets our heart beat every time it beats. This is the God who knows everything about us and loves us anyway, and he's coming to hang out with us. He's coming to be with us. He's coming to be Emmanuel. He's coming to be God with us. And let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that season. And yeah, and everything that comes with it is so fun. It's so much, so exciting, you know, all the things and, and, and the lights and, and, and all that it's made out to be. But it's about God. And what if we as Christians could really start looking at all of that stuff and being like, hey, Jesus is coming. Hey, that's cool, but Jesus is coming. Yeah, that's great, but Jesus is coming. Yeah, I got you a gift, but guess what? I have a better one I can tell you about. He's coming, and he's coming soon. So, why did we need Jesus? The church already had the plan mapped out, right? They are, they, when the church was established. It had been established since Moses came down. It's like, here's the law. 
And here's what we have to do. And this is how we're made right with God. And this is how we get to heaven. The law was good and it was all right. And, 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 and then all of a sudden, you need this dude, Jesus. Why? Why do we need him? Right. But there were people that were really good at it. And everybody thought they were keeping the law. There were Pharisees and Sadducees, the ones that taught the law and kept it and did everything. They were really good at it, though, right? Why would God send his son if they had these people that were so good at it in the church? <laughs> these perfect people in the church. Because they weren't really perfect. Jesus said something amazing about them. He's like, they're, you're whitewashed tombs. You're so clean on the outside, but your inside is full of dead man's bones. Right? Jesus, Jesus saw right through it. God saw right through it. It's like I said, this is our friend. This is the one who cares more about us than we can imagine. So much so that even these perfect people, he said, I'm going to have to send my son because you've got it all messed up. You think it's about the way you look, <coughs> not the way your insides look. And so 700 years, I want you to understand this, this, this longing, this, 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 this Advent season, this season where we're like, why does it take so long? I can't stand to wait. Isaiah 700 was a prophet 700 years before Jesus came, wrote about Jesus' coming. And people don't understand, like this Bible, it wasn't like, hey, it's all this happened, so I'm just going to, in a timeline, I'm just going to do it. If you look, if you really look at it, Maybe the Chronicles and, and uh, Malachi was like the closest thing to the New Testament in the Bible that we have. And it was 400 years before. There was a season, right, where there was like, we need to hear from God. The church was established. The church was going. Things were happening. But it was this gap. And, and I don't really get it, right? So what was that? I'm sending my son. But 700 years before, Isaiah wrote this. Before Jesus actually came. Chris, you love to say this. How long has we, have we been a country? 240? Am I putting you on the spot? Golly, we have better time. That's like 243 <laughs> We've been a country for 243 years. and The United States has actually been a country. And it seems like eternity, right? That's all of our history and everything that we know. And most of us don't even know most of that history. It's like 200... This was 700 years before Jesus came. Isaiah wrote this, and it's in chapter 53. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Now, I want you to know he was prophesying this before Jesus is coming. Before he came, he prophesied this. Here he comes, and this is what he's going to be like. This is what Jesus is going to do. There's nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and he was rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with the, with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. Who's we? The church. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. You know, when he came, the church looked at Jesus and was like, who is this guy? Why is he here? And I can see all the stuff that he's going through and the troubles that he's had and the troubles he's carrying because God don't even like him. Yet it was our weaknesses that he was carrying. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left, God, left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of, all, of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he didn't open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in this stream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. 
but it was the good, Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan was to prosper in his hands. Will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for we will bear for he will bear the sins, bear all of their sins. I will give him the honor of a victorious soldier. Because he exposed himself to death, he was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. That's why he came. And Isaiah wasn't writing this to a bunch of lost people. He was writing this to a group of people that called themselves God's people. And he was like, God's going to send this guy. It's going to be 700 years, but he's coming. You need to be ready because he will come. And they didn't recognize him when he came, and he prophesied about all this. And they, they rebelled against him. They didn't like him, and we know the church actually put him to death. But it was for us. It was for our sin. It was for our, for, for, for our glory and for, so that we could be made right with God. And that's what we celebrate this season, is that God loved us so much that he sent his only son so that anybody who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life in heaven with him. And that's absolutely what we celebrate. And I pray that everybody in here believes that and everybody in here has accepted him as their Savior because that is such a freeing thing. It's such a joyful thing. It's not a time to be sad. It's a time to rejoice because we know God and he knows us. We've been called his children. We're now his descendants. We are adopted into a beautiful family that we don't deserve to be in because of Jesus Christ and what he did. And we celebrate that in this season. And so there's this thing also that we celebrate in Advent, and that's the coming, the second coming of Jesus. The thing that, that most people are kind of, if I say that in here today, everybody's like, I want him to come, but not today. Give me a few more days to get my stuff straight. I got some people I need to make amends with, and, I, and, and you know what, I don't really want him to come today. Anybody ever said that? Have you ever heard the old saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die? Everybody wants Jesus to come, just not today. How can you celebrate and eagerly anticipate and hopefully, hopefully wait on something that you don't really want to happen right now? <laughs> Why is it that? Why is it that? Because he says, joyfully anticipate my coming. Joyfully anticipate that I'm going to be there. That these times will pass. That this is something that's only temporary and I'm offering something that is eternal. Celebrate that. Why wouldn't we celebrate that? Why, don't we, why wouldn't we embrace that? You know, and there's something that, 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 that hit me a long time ago. And it was, it's, 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 it's in Matthew. I want, to, I want to read that. In Matthew chapter 24. Verse 36. Starting in verse 36, it says, however, it says, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, when Jesus will come back. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself know. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This, this is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour in the, at, a, at the meal. One will be taken, the other will be left. So you two must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. And see, I've looked at that verse, and some of y'all may look at it when I'm reading it like that, and been like, it's like this, like this, oh no, I really don't know. I was, I'm going to be hanging out with one of my friends, and all of a sudden he's going to be gone. Funniest thing I ever heard was when a couple of kids that used to be in my young adults class, they, they were in college, and they, went this, they played this trick on this dude. It's like they were all supposed to be going somewhere. They laid all their clothes on the floor and hid. 
And, the, and they were really big into church and Christians, and they were like, he was, the, 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 the amazing thing that a college student would even have thought about the rapture. But they laid their clothes on the floor, hid from him, he walked in the room, and he's like, <gasps> and they like jumped out and didn't give him much time. He thought that they were literally gone. <laughs> they didn't talk about it. Right? So, so it was like, it's like that. But that's what the Bible says about it happening. Okay? And there's, there's this video, and I want you to watch it really quick. And it, it's only a minute long, and, and, and I'm going gonna, gonna to close after we watch this. But I want you to I wanna show you something. Now, this, I want to set this up. This guy's preaching, and he's talking about the coming, and, and then it, all of a sudden it happens. And it's, it, it hit me. I saw this 15 years ago, and it's still pretty strong. So, anyway, go watch it. Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month, or he might come next week, or he could even come. <laughs> this, I read this, I do this, and I've always focused on that guy weeping on the floor. Oh, that would suck to be him. <laughs> you know, and I've always been like that, and I've always worried, but let me tell you something what the Bible says about heaven. Let me tell you what the Bible says about going and being home with the Lord. It says there will be no suffering, there will be no pain, there will be nothing but joy, there will be no sadness, there will only be rejoicing, right? Rejoicing in the Lord. Every one of those people is who we need to be focused on because that's us if we are what we say we are. If we do believe, if we've asked Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, the rejoicing that's going on because all of a sudden it's not about not saying God doesn't care about those ones that's left behind. What I'm saying is what about the ones who aren't? That's what we celebrate in Advent, the coming of the Lord. The day that that happens, when we're working and we're, we're slaving and we're in those jobs that we can't stand going to, we're in those places that are hard to be in, we're in those relationships that are so tough, we're dealing with those problems that are so hard to deal with, we're doing all this stuff in this world and all of a sudden, boom! We're in perfection. It's taken away. It's not there anymore. The promises have come true. Everything that we ever were told is even better than we could imagine. We're all sitting up there going, oh, <laughs> this is why he was like, it's worth everything. It's worth everything. Man, focus on that for a moment. Because I don't. If, if we're worried about those people on the floor, where are we? What do we need to do today? If we're worried about those people that are left, we need to right now go to God and say, God, I don't want to be that person. I want to know that I know that I know that I have a relationship with you. I want to believe. Help me believe. Help me to have faith. Help me to be with you, God. I know you sent your son for me. Help me believe that. Help my faith. Because I want to be there. I want to, I, want to, I want to joyfully look forward to you coming back. I want to know that your promises are true about my children and what you've promised me about my relationships and everything that I have. Everything that, I, everything that you promised is now true. God, you love me too much to have to, for me to be worried about what I'm going to miss if you come tomorrow, if you come tonight, if you come today. I know it's like some of us say, well, I want to see my grandkids grow up. I want to see this happen. I want to see this happen. I want to be married one day. I want to have kids one day. I want to do something one day. Something in my life that I wish that I could just do before you come. And he's like, don't worry about it. Do you not think I love you enough to know the desires of your heart? <coughs> Don't you think that if God loves you that much and he comes in and it's before you thought he should, his ideas are better than yours? Because I believe that with everything that I am. And I believe that's what this season is about.
please come. You've already conquered this stuff. You've already defeated <coughs> Satan. And Amber reminded us of claiming that in our homes and in our lives and in our relationships and in everything we do. But he's already be he's already won. He's already beaten. He's already won the war. It's our job to claim it. It's our job to proclaim it in Jesus' name. And it's, that's why we celebrate. That's why we're here. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Reminder, what is Advent? Expectant waiting. I can't wait because I have a king, and he's over all this stuff. And he's fixing to clear the way, and I'm fixing to go home. He's on my team. He's on my side. I'm on the good, I'm on the good side. I'm not coming out on the bad end of this. There, I'm not going to be the one crying on the floor. I'm going to be the one celebrating. I'm going to be following him right into victory. Right? Dang right. That's it. Joyful preparation. What's the difference in joyful preparation and mourning? I'm celebrating because I got a guest coming. And he knows my, my family's not perfect. He knows my stuff ain't perfect. And guess what? He loves me anyway, so I don't care what you got to say about me. None of y'all, none of everybody else. And sure not this voice in my head that keeps battling me, this spiritual battle that keeps telling me I'm not worthy. I ain't listening to it no more. This is my joy. I'm going to sing every Christmas song. I'm going to celebrate everything I want to celebrate. I'm going to do everything I want to do. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to joyfully prepare for my guests. And some of us like to make that really cozy and I can't wait. I got the coffee going. And some of us like to hang crazy lights off of our roof. <laughs> I just don't want you to miss this house. And I'm not talking to Santa Claus. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but let's do it how God's leading us to do it and enjoy it and not worry about what people have to say about it. It's about us and God and preparing the way joyfully for Him to come and Him to have His way in our lives and in our home and then to take us home. And hope. Hopeful anticipation. I know it's going to be better. I know you got this. I know you're coming. I know this is only temporary. I know this. I know this too will pass. And I can't wait. <laughs> I'm hoping in anticipation for Jesus to come in and be my hero, right? This is my message for those haters on Christmas. <laughs> I'm not even looking up from my page on that one. <laughs> Stop letting your enemy destroy, destroy the joy of Christmas. Stop. It's not what it's about. It's just not. It's all about the person that you didn't invite present. Show me that scripture. This is one place in scripture we can say, hey, this is a little bit about us, though, isn't it? Because we get a big present. But most importantly, it's about him. And it's about him glorifying himself through you, through his son, Jesus. Man, it's not about that. But hey, have fun with it. Do something dumb. <laughs> Buy something they don't want and say, hey, I thought you were really going to like this. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. I'm not talking to you, Chris. He'd be the only one to do that. <laughs> I thought you wanted this Monopoly game, John. <laughs> we play Monopoly. Got it. Check. <laughs> Advent. All this stuff we do. Every day, every time we come together, every time we hang out, every time we talk on the phone, I want to celebrate this season of joy and love again. Okay? Everything that we do, let's don't let's let's be positive about this. Let's be joyful about this. And however that looks, I'm not saying to avoid problems that we're dealing with, but rejoice in the fact that he's got victory over them already. It's already over. He's already won. We just have to claim that victory in our lives and in our families. Let's don't let it be stolen from us. It's not what it's about. This is a joyful season of anticipation. Hopeful waiting. 
right? For the kingdom. Let's hold on to that. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everybody that you have here today. I thank you for assurance uh, in, in, in our relationships with you. So God, I pray that uh, for everyone in here who, who's a Christian and who's like, man, I just don't know if I want you to come today, God. God, I pray that you meet us where we are with that, that you meet us in the place where, where, where we need to be, God. And for the one in here who, who's not sure, God, I pray that you don't stop, that you don't stop calling, that you don't stop pouring out your love. God, it's your love that draws us to you. So it's your love that leads us to repentance. It is what uh, motivates us. So God, I pray that you don't quit pouring out your love on that person who, who don't really understand this whole concept of, of being saved and, and being a child of God. Uh, Father, you're the, the only one in our soul who can, who can set that straight, who can explain that in our hearts, what that means. So God, is that is that sinking in? Is that starting to to move in, in the hearts of, of the ones who need it most, God, I pray that you don't stop. You continue showing them that, that, God, you sent your son for them, that Jesus is our Savior, that this is the season that we celebrate that, that the coming of God, the coming of you and, and your redemption of, of, of a broken, broken world. Um, God, I pray that, 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 you, that you move in the hearts of all of us to, to give us joy and to give us patience and peace and and love and kindness and, and gentleness, self-control, all the things, to God, that you give us in your spirit. And what that looks like and how we pour that out into our lives and our families and, and our situations that we're in. And, God, into this season that's so hectic. Um, God, I pray that you pour out all of your good things, all of your good gifts. Um, Holy Spirit, that you speak through us, that you lead us, that you sing through us, that you uh, help us see with your eyes this season that, that's that's... It's crazy, but God, it's all about you. Uh, Father, I thank you for everything that's going on in here. Uh, God, we thank you. Uh, we talked last week about just giving you thanks in the midst of everything. So God, everything that's going on in this room and all of the thoughts and fears and, and hopes and dreams, God, we thank you for all of them, and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in it. God, we invite your ideas into our life, your way into our life. We invite your presence into everything that we're dealing with. Thank you so much again. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.